Okay, let's start this webinar for today. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our second um, webinar on Cape Fine and Rare Wine, our masterclass. Today, we're going to look at the exciting allure of Stellenbosch Cabernet Sauvignons um, and also a big part about the Cabernet Collective. Um, and we want to understand what makes the wines from this region so special and, and why does Stellenbosch stand out the way it does. Um, so yeah, we've got, we've got really exciting lots um, on auction as well. And um, yeah, so, so we're going to talk about it through, through the next 20, 25 minutes. Um, and for today we're going to welcome Warren Ellis. Um, he's called a young gun uh, winemaker. Um, he's from, from Neil Ellis uh, Wines. Also his father, Neil Ellis. Also my second job in the wine industry was at Neil Ellis. So I'm particularly fond of, of, of Neil Ellis and the whole estate and what you stand for. Um, and then also we've got Kathy and Francia Rottenbach joining. Kathy, uh, MW, she is also Kathy and Francia is uh, judges at the Cape Fine and Rare Wine Auction. Um, and they bring an absolute wealth of information and wisdom and um, just to the table. Kathy's got obviously the ear and the palate from the international um, audience and Francia not only is he uh, probably the best job in South Africa or in the world, he's the, the senior buyer for Singita. I don't know if you know the Singita Lodges, um, but he gets to spend absolutely beautiful time in the beautiful side of South Africa that none of us can afford it, but it's just too beautiful. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about what makes the Cabernets special. Um, and the talking points basically is going to say, what is Cabernet Collective? What does that mean? What does that stand for? Um, we want to understand, I mean, the, the, what's on lot is basically, we're going to talk appellation. It's all the way from Sermonsburg right through to the Helderberg. What is the climatic influences? And I think Kathy is doing quite a bit of research um, on that also for the Cabernet Collective that she can share with us. Um, and then also, um, what can we expect from this lot? Why, why would you buy? Why, Francia, would you be interested in a lot like that for, for your Sangita Lodges? Um, and then, yeah, what are we talking about of these wines if you've got it on your dinner table? So um, we really look forward to some really great conversation um, between Francia, Kathy and Warren. And then um, just four questions. I think we can leave questions, but please ask the questions on your question and answer button at the bottom. Um, and then if there's a question and the panel is talking about that, I'll put up my hand and ask the question. Otherwise, we'll keep the questions towards the end and then we will um, deal with your questions. So thank you very much and enjoy. Okay, floor is yours, Warren. Okay, great. So just quickly a little bit on the Cabernet Collective. Um, so we, we basically, um, <clears throat> we are a, uh, a consortium of uh, Cabernet producers in Stellenbosch um, that shares the same vision. We've got the same goals and that's really to, um, to, to put Stellenbosch and Cabernet um, on the map. And the producers in this Cabernet Collective, we, we're all very like-minded and believe that Stellenbosch as a region has the potential to grow some of the best Cabernet Sauvignons in the world. So uh, with that said is uh, Stellenbosch, I think what a lot of people don't realize of not only Stellenbosch, of, but of South Africa with uh, while well, traveling short distances. And I think uh, Kathy will most probably um, uh, share her view on it as uh, within, a, within traveling short distances, it's uh, you have very big um, differences in terroir, in climate, and um, so what's what's my feeling? What's really interesting of this lot is you're going to have a a, a um, 
you're going to have a view of what Stellenbosch and Cabernet is all about. Um, just thought on, I'm just, I'm just struggling here with my, uh, uh, I can't. Warren, could I jump in yeah. here quickly? Yeah, so, sorry, Kathy. I'm just, I'm struggling um, here with my Zoom with Zoom at the moment. Yes. Well, if I can jump in and just tell you or tell the viewers here what I think is Stellenbosch's secret weapon, um, aside from it being Cabernet. But what I think makes Stellenbosch a wonderful place to grow grapes is its topography. Um, as you probably all know, um, Stellenbosch is located really quite closely to two or three major water bodies being the Indian Ocean, oh, no, sorry, being the Atlantic Ocean, the cold Atlantic Ocean on the one side, and then False Bay on the other side, which is a mix of the um, cold Atlantic and the slightly warmer Indian. And Stellenbosch as an area within, say, almost just 10 kilometers for the sea, you can rise in altitude up to 1,500, 1,600 meters above sea level. And that difference in altitude is what um, gives rise to a varied topography. So you go from sea level right up to the mountains over a very short distance. The other contribution to this varied topography that Stellenbosch has is that when the um, plate, um, the Falk, Falkland plate collided with the southern tip of Africa many, many years ago. It created what we call the Cape Fold Belt Mountains. And the Stellenbosch Mountains and the other mountains in the Stellenbosch area are part of that. And these mountains are folded like this. And um, that gave the area part of its unique topography in contributing to the aspect and to the slope, which is so important in Stellenbosch. The aspect in that it gives farmers, oh my gosh, you can get farms that have got that face all four points on the compass and all eight or all 16 points in between on the compass. So you've got um, warm, um, you've got eastern slopes that can get the sunrise in the morning you've got southeast slopes you've got north facing slopes you've got westerly facing slopes and everything in between and that different aspect creates obviously different microclimates for the vineyards and the vines in those vineyards you've also got as i mentioned before this very quick rise in altitude which gives rise to some steep slopes and some shallower slopes and that, of course, helps with water retention. Um, it helps with um, the movement of air throughout Stellenbosch. And a final point I'd like to make about Stellenbosch's unique position in respect to these oceans is that the majority of the, um, the Western Cape's wine growing areas are actually condensed into a very narrow band, far narrower than you'll have in Australia or in Chile or in Argentina, for example. And so the impact of the water bodies being the Atlantic Ocean and then False Bay um, is actually felt throughout South Africa's um, Western Cape wine regions, and in particular Stellenbosch. And so the, um, the closeness of the proximity of the oceans, and therefore the impact of the sea breezes as they come in off those oceans, the aspects or the directions that the vineyards face, and then the slopes themselves, and of course the very many soils that we have in Stellenbosch, all make it a very special place. So topography, and all the contributing factors to that, I believe, are Stellenbosch's secret weapon, and that allows us to make such great Cabernet Sauvignon. Kathy, if I may, so um, with, okay. with the contributing factor of the Atlantic Ocean, one would actually even say we are much closer to a continental climate. With these warm days, we have 30 going up to 40 degrees Celsius, and because of the proximity to the Atlantic Ocean, it's... Um, your, 
the temperature will drop right down to 15 degrees Celsius. And even some mornings during midsummer, it'll go down in certain areas, even down to about 10, even nine degrees Celsius. So really, and that's uh, those temperature differences really what you want in, um, in growing, especially Cabernet Sauvignon, because th these temperature differences definitely, it helps you with your, um, with your color development as well as your, your tannin. And that's really what, what one wants um, from Cabernet Sauvignon. You, you really want this really nice intense color. And of course, tannins for the structure and the backbone of, um, of these wines. I think that's absolutely that correct. Um, in terms of temperature differences, yes, you could say we have almost continental temperature differences, although we are a very much a maritime climate because we're yeah. influenced by the, the oceans. Sorry, Francois, I interrupted you. Uh, not at all. There. I think th that um, is very exciting in terms of, of the, um, the influences and, and why it's such a, a great place to grow Cabernet. Um, you, uh, We've seen that there's the opportunity for a reasonably good hang time as well, really developing a lot of flavor. And, and that's where I think there's been some significant strides forward, particularly in the last 20 years, which is an area where these lots are well covered. And, and I think that the, the, the challenge for many wine lovers is, we've been talking about all these different parts of Stellenbosch. How do you get to experience those uh, in a vertical format, uh, sorry, in a horizontal format, where you can see the different influences, the different parts of Stellenbosch. That's the beauty of having these collections, uh, especially when you've got wonderfully mature vin uh, vintages like 2009, which was a, a highly fetid vintage, and a vintage that I've had the pleasure of looking at over many, many years. Um, though these having been sourced directly from the producers, sellers themselves, their wine libraries, means they're in, in fantastic condition. So it's, it's a really brilliant way uh, for yourself and a few friends to really have an, not only a pleasurable experience, but sort of uh, infotainment at the same time. Educate yourselves in terms of uh, what the caliber of these wines are, um, not only in their youth, because of course today you can go to the farms uh, 50 years ago, uh, Stellenbosch started the whole wine roots idea, so it's been going for a while, but it, it's far more challenging to look at young Cabernet and understand how wonderful and how rewarding it can be with the right maturity. So here you've got in these selections some wonderful wines, really, um, the, some of them haven't even reached their plateau yet, but they're definitely all showing some wonderful drinkability already. So uh, well worth diving into. Yeah, definitely. And um, Francia, as you as you said, not not only um, so there's two lots available, um, so you can experience it like you said horizontally. But there, well, there's also a, a lot where you can experience Cabernet Sauvignon vertically, where you've got vintages from 2009 all all, all the way to 2014. Yeah, which is lovely because it was a it was a very interesting time period uh, for those uh, vintages in Stellenbosch. So um, there's uh, wines of power, there's wines of finesse, depending on the vintage, and that's really yeah. interesting um, to see how Cabernet reacts to these different growing seasons. Really uh, warm years, somewhat cooler years. Um, the beauty of Cabernet is that it actually um, in uh, well-judged um, vineyard management and winemaking terms can be very rewarding in that sense, really great learning opportunities. Uh, Francho, in, in your eyes, 2009 vintage, um, more tight, I'd say more tightly knit vintage if you look at, um, at the wines available with a little bit more structure to it? Uh, very much. Um, these wines are also uh, some of the, the very finest practitioners of Cabernet growing and making. Um, so some uh, stellar classic names and some more modern names as well. Um, Oldenburg being one of them. 
Um, and in fact, the Simon Sach, the Garland, is a wine that is a well-established vineyard, but it's not a wine that they produced in the past. So it's, it's wonderful to see some of the, the really classic producers um, and showing them being at the top of their game, really capturing that um, beautiful structure and concentration. Yeah. Um, but I think in this case, you've got producers who uh, managed it well and didn't over go overboard because on, in a great vintage, there is always the risk that you can overdo it. But these are certainly producers who had that uh, uh, sense of finesse uh, to, to really capture the, the, the success of the vintage. No, definitely. I think that they're all stellar producers of Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, I think if I remember 2009 vintage correctly, yes, we did have our warm days, but the evenings was, they were really nice and cool. And um, I usually have a quite a, an in-depth look at, at ripening um, of bunches. And I'd say if, if you look at a bunch, usually in general, in general, you'll find a lot of, uh, let's say you won't find uni uniformity in ripening within a bunch. You'll have berries that's very ripe, berries that's under ripe, but I can remember 2009 vintage. I think if, if you had to pick a berry, squeeze it out, look at the sugar, uh, I'd say it was one of those vintages where all of the berries basically had the same sugar concentration at the same time. It was, it was a really amazing vintage. Very even, and I, and I think that's where you're seeing that um, that frame in the wine, which um, it, the vintage has gone through its periods where it sort of went into a bit of dormancy, but I think they've started to open up again, um, showing more. So they're going into the, 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 the secondary tertiary characters. So you're starting to see the, the savory elements yeah. coming out. Um, but some... Uh, very good concentration of, of hidden fruit. Um, so that's now slowly starting to unfurl and emerge. Yeah. Um, if, if we go back to lot one, that's a little bit more, uh, that's got a vertical tasting. I mean, we've got their vintages, like I said, from 2009 to two, 2014. And I think that's, that's also a very interesting lot because you've got, it's a, uh, it's a nice way to see um, to see all the vintages in in South Africa. I mean, 2009 being a stellar vintage. I mean, I'm I'm somebody that I'm, I never throw away a vintage like 2010. It's for me one of the prettiest vintages. It's it's really it's voluptuous and it's a vintage that's I'd say very perfumey um, and very uh, much. And a perfect yeah. example in the Lady May, uh, having that Definitely. as the 20th vintage. I can tell yeah. you that it's a, a beloved vintage of Singita guests. Um, they have really enjoyed looking at that vintage and have, um, in fact, purchased quite significantly of the wine. Um, so that's definitely a, a very good example. Um, but interesting, I think that it's turned out to be very well positioned the producers and the choices of the vintages that they've submitted. Um, yeah. Where I think that for Ernie Els, the 2011 is a, was a, an excellent vintage for them. Um, so that's very much a case of this is almost a, 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 a perfect seeding of the different vintages. Um, where you're you getting yeah. Murati for 2013. Um, I would definitely look to the Simonsburg area uh, for 2013, whereas 2014, much more the Helderberg. Yeah, yeah. 2014. If you look, if you have a look at 2014, it was one of our bigger, bigger vintages. Uh, a lot of crop out there. There were, I can remember a, a little bit of untimely rain, but 2014, I think also a little bit more, more elegant. Um, also a tight, I'd say tight vintage. Um, but I think as a as a new producer, Peter Falker, uh, I think they've they've really they've really got that vintage right. I think it's also one of the uh, they uh, 
I think it's it's a vintage that, that put them on the map over the last couple of years. Yeah, I think that's when you um, really took uh, notice of it. My, my favorite vintage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think they they at the moment they they're producing really stellar Cabernet Sauvignons. I think one of one of my father's first first cabs actually came from came from that farm where uh, where Peter Falk is now. I think it used to be called Groenland or Groenvle, Groenvle. and um, really beautiful cabs from 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 that area. And then, of course, 2012, it's really one of my favorites vintages. It's, it's, it's not big. I think 2012 is a vintage. It, it's, it's tight and it's re for me, I think it's a vintage that really still needs to open up. It's for me a dark horse. Yeah, but it, it, it's definitely, I would agree with you, it's a vintage that uh, we invested in significantly at Sugita. Um, the, the right producers, and in this case, I think Alto is a, a good choice, um, certainly have produced some very, very interesting wines. Yeah, definitely. That's a lovely spread of, um, of wines in that case, because it does give you some that have grown on the um, Simonsberg Stellenbosch side and others that come more from the Helderberg side of Stellenbosch. And um, yeah. it, for those who don't know, you get um, the, the Helderberg grown by wines are usually tighter, tauter, and last longer in the bottle. Um, and whereas the um, ones from the Simonsbach side, where um, Glenelli is coming from and Marasi, they have this um, wonderful black fruit um, and an almost an opulence that you want to drink immediately, but then a structure that, that does reward lengthy aging in the bottle. Yeah, there's some questions um, if I can um, ask you yeah. to answer. Um, the first one is, what is the investment potential of Stellenbosch calves versus those from potentially Bordeaux or Napa? Um. So now I think maybe this is a question that Francia should should really answer because he'll be he'll be more objective than a, than a winemaker because I thoroughly well I thoroughly believe that we we have really good aging potential. I mean we've got wines um, in our cellar that 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 still drinks very well. Um, dating back to the to the early eighties when when my father started. Um, and uh, I can remember somebody, there was, I think, I can't remember who told the story, but uh, Madame May that, that owns um, uh, Glen Ellie, I think before she bought in South Africa, she went out to, to some of our wine farms to see what, what, what Stellenbosch is all about. And also, of course, the aging potential of Stellenbosch wine, and uh, more in particular, Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, Bordeaux varieties. And her comment was, if you look at Stellenbosch, and especially Cabernet, there's a lot of a lot of Stellenbosch's wines ages just as well, or even better than some of the great Bordeaux vintages. So. Well, according to her, and I, I'll take her word for it, <laughs> she's uh, um, that. That's her opinion, and um, but yeah, I think maybe Francois deals with a lot of older vintages and sells a lot of older vintage wines uh, to his customers. So I think uh, Francois, if, if if you'd like to, uh, South Africa actually. Uh, offers some very interesting um, investment potential, which already we, we're seeing are, are being realized in, in the last few years. People have started to really understand that there is um, great drinking pleasure, um, and, and that translates positively into investment potential. Um, we know that you can invest in, um, as a fixed investment, some of the great vintages from Bordeaux, but the, the, the entry cost is substantial. 
Uh, and, and that is a major challenge. Not only that, but um, in Europe and America, you have to um, really expend a vast amount of money on the right storage conditions. It is critical that if you wanting to invest in, in any form of wine for the long term, you need to uh, mature it in the right conditions, right temperatures and humidities, etc. But we, we've got advantages in, in Southern Africa in that sense, because um, it's still very much affordable to buy these uh, producers, the very best producers from Stellenbosch. And they, we are seeing a significant realization of, of um, in, investment value. Uh, from 10 years onwards, the right vintages are pretty much unobtainable in South Africa and the world. Uh, and they're made in much smaller quantities than uh, some of the great Bordeaux producers. So if, you know, if um, Chateau Margaux can produce 35,000 cases of 12, that's a fair amount of wine, no matter the fact that the world is a large place. Whereas many of the Stellenbosch producers are far smaller. So when we get 10 years or 15 years or 20 years down the line, a great vintage is a very rare commodity. So there is a significant uh, development in the prices. Um, and we've seen from recent auctions that there is um, some really good progression. So I think it, it offers uh, three things. It, it offers some wonderful drinking pleasure. And I agree with Madame May that the South African and particularly Stellenbosch Cabernets show a finesse and elegance um, that is not on the blockbuster level. And let's face fact, if you invest in some great wine when you're 30 and you drink it in 20 or 30 years time, even if you're not selling it, by then your, your system has changed a little bit and you may not be enjoying blockbuster wine anymore. Mm. It may just be the case that uh, a beautiful full medium Cabernet from Stellenbosch is the perfect wine to enjoy with some uh, special friends. So I think this is the time uh, and uh, all things are pointing to the fact that these wines are going to become harder and harder to get your hands on um, over the next decade. The world is switching on to these wines and we're seeing more and more interest. Um, I can attest to uh, over the past 20 years uh, with Sangeeta guests that their interest has grown exponentially. Oh, that's wonderful. I think that that goes with, with some of the other questions. There was one question just in terms of um, our counterparts, Chile, or some of our competitors. Um, does the same conversation um, goes for that? Um, I, I think that uh, you have different wines that do different things, which is the beauty of internationalism. Uh, I think when one is younger, you tend to enjoy wines that are uh, easier to understand and, and uh, are a little more accessible. Many people tend to think that uh, a wine should taste expensive. It should show all sorts of fancy uh, bells and whistles, as in expensive oak or significant concentration. But more and more, as one develops your palate and you uh, grow a little bit more self-assured in terms of enjoying the wines with the right foods uh, and friends, you find that wines that are not as massively concentrated uh, and still retain a sense of where they come from, a sense of place. And, and Stellenbosch has got a very distinctive sense of place in these wines now. Um, these wines become far more attractive. So some of the, the areas that you named may be uh, exciting wines uh, to, to, um, to find in terms of an accessible style, but we're seeing more and more as, as people sort of start to understand wines that they um, go to wines where there is this more um, interest and um, not delicacy, oh. certainly finesse, yes. Mm. Guys, that brings us to the end of our webinar looking at Cabernets from Stellenbosch. Um, Warren, Kathy, Francia, thank you so much for joining us today. This was really insightful. Every time I join a webinar, I make notes like crazy because I learn so much. I hope you've done the same. Um, if you want to join us um, for any future webinars, 
please just uh, look on Facebook or on Instagram and follow us. We will update all the details there. And if you haven't uh, registered for the Cape Finery One auction, please do so on our website. To, uh, we don't want you to miss out on these wonderful lots that we discussed today. We will also upload the, the conversation onto our social platforms. Thank you very much. And uh, we hopefully we'll see you next year, next week. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.